Let's pray together. Lord, I pray. I pray that, again, you take this scripture, help it come alive. May the written word become the living word within us. And again, Lord, I pray that you fulfill it in our lives. Speak to each person, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, uh, a while back I read about the McBride family. The McBrides had 12 children. The first 11 children had biblical names. But they had trouble deciding upon the 12th child's biblical name. And so they prayed about it. A couple of days later, before she was to go home from the hospital, just before they were to sign the birth certificate, she received a gift. And the gift was, had a card. And that card had a very moving, very touching, very emotional poem. And she knew this was a sign from God that this child was to have the name of this author of this poem. And so the first 11 children had biblical names. This child had the name Anonymous McBride. <laughs> there is a story behind everybody's name. Every parent had a reason for choosing your name. We had reasons for choosing our children's names. My name is Charles Franklin Armistead. I'm named after both my grandfathers. But because they didn't want to show favoritism, they gave me nicknames, and so I was Skipper. All the way through high school, then college, they shifted over to Skip. My fraternity brothers did. Now, I've had other people in my life have other choice names for me, but we won't go into those, okay? Your name has a power to it, to somebody. Every name has some kind of image that comes to people when you think about it. Now, I'm going to give you some names. These names have some power that associated with what comes to your mind when you think of the name Peyton Manning, you think of Tiger Woods. You think of Abraham Lincoln, Barack Obama, Martin Luther King Jr., Santa Claus, Rudolph, Dolly Parton. Your name, your best friend's name a person you don't care for. What comes to your mind when you hear the name Jesus? There's a power that's associated with names. Now let's look at the two names in today's scripture. The first we're going to look at is Emmanuel. El is God. Eman is with us. God is with us. They shall call his name Emmanuel, for God is with us. So what does it matter that God is with us? Who cares? if God is with us. Why is that so important? Well, there's a parable that was told in a story that we used to hear all the time. I don't know if you've heard it recently. I haven't heard it recently. It's a story about a man who, on Christmas Eve, didn't want to go to the Christmas Eve service and said, I, I just can't go anymore because I just don't believe. Um, I know too much about how the Bible is put together. I know too much about church history. I know too much about philosophy. I know too much about how people twist things around. And so I just don't believe anymore. So I'm not going to go to the Christmas Eve service. So she and the children got dressed, and they went to the Christmas Eve service. It was 11 o'clock service, and uh, it was cold. In fact, the temperatures were in the single digits. And so this father sat down in the living room just to read a book. He, he put a fire together in the fireplace because it was cold. And as he was sitting by this warm fire, reading his book, waiting for the family to come home, he heard a thump on the window. He looked, didn't see anything, heard a thump, thump. He got up, went to the window, and then he saw some birds trying to fly into the window, and then he reasoned it was so cold outside, and they saw the fire, and they were trying to get to the warmth. So he puts on a coat, he puts on his uh, hat and gloves, goes to his garage, opens the garage door, turns on the light, makes sure the heat's on in there, and tries to get the birds to come in. Birds wouldn't come in. They're afraid of him. He recognizes that. So he puts some food out to entice them. They still wouldn't come. He tries to get behind them and shoo them in, but they wouldn't go. And then he reasoned, if I could only become a bird, I would tell them they didn't have to be afraid of me. 
and I would show them how to get to the light in the darkness, and I would show them where to get to the warmth in the coldness. And I would take them in there, I would lead them in to, to shelter and, and for protection. At that very moment, he could hear a block away the church where they're having the Christmas Eve service, everyone began to sing Silent Night. And then he remembered that's exactly what God did. Came as a human to be like us, to say we don't have to be afraid of God. In fact, God wants to be a light that shines in our darkness, he wants to provide warmth and shelter when we're in the cold of winters of our lives. Emmanuel, God with us. Now that's very important because that means God is with us in our lives, not way out there somewhere, but very much a part of us in everything that we do, providing light, protection, guidance. Danny Aguila, a friend of mine, who died about a year ago, was a pastor who grew up in the Philippines. He used to work at United Methodist Communication. Danny was a little boy in the Philippines in a village when the uh, Japanese attacked the Philippines at the beginning of World War II. He says that uh, everyone in the village ran to the hill. They had advance warnings, so they all ran to the hill to hide in the woods, in the fields, and they all laid flat. It was Christmas Eve. And he said the, the moon was shining so bright, you, it was almost like day, and so everyone had to be very still. And he said the Japanese arrived and they went through the village and they began to reason. He could tell that the people had left and gone to another town. They started burning the place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Danny's family and the whole village was afraid for one reason. Danny's mother was about to give birth to a child. She had already gone into labor. And they were praying for God to be with them and to protect them and that she wouldn't have... And they didn't have any anesthetic. In the wee hours of the morning, it was still dark. The moon was about to go down. The Japanese were about to leave. Danny's father found him in the woods and said, Your mama gave birth to a baby. And we named him Emmanuel. For surely God has been with us tonight. There's a power that comes when we know that God is with us in the midst of our situations. Emmanuel, God with us. But also the other name that's in the scripture is Jesus. It is, you shall name him Jesus, for he shall save his, the people from their sins. Now the name Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua. Both of them mean he saves or he will save. Jesus comes to save. Now, that's really important to understand as a distinction. Now, we, last two weeks, we looked at John the Baptist. And remember, John the Baptist had a thing about pointing his arm out to you and with a finger and says, repent, for the kingdom of God is head. In other words, get rid of your sins. Turn away from your sins. Now, it's interesting that Jesus uses the very same phrase when he begins his ministry. He puts his hand out and he says, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. But he doesn't point his finger he reaches out with his hand. See, there's a big difference between John the Baptist who points the finger and condemns and Jesus who reaches out his hand to save from sin. As it says in John 3.17, For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now, how does Jesus save? Jesus saves, well, let's just go back to an image we've looked at before. If you're out in the ocean, you're in the ocean, you're treading water, you don't have a life preserver, you don't have anything to hold on to. Let's say you're a great swimmer and you can tread water for four or five days. You can't do it forever, though. Eventually, you're drowning. You're going to need someone to save you. You're going to need a savior. Well, when the lifeguard comes to you, Remember, if you're ever in this situation and someone's coming to save you, do not grab the lifeguard. For if you do, what happens? You both drown because the lifeguard's not free to save you. Instead, if someone comes to save you, keep enough mind and sense about yourself to remember, you've got to trust the lifeguard. 
to surrender your will, your fight, to totally trust the lifeguard to save you. Likewise, when Jesus comes to save us, he'll stay back until we trust him. Until we surrender our wills, surrender our fight, our desires to him. Now, Jesus comes to save us, and he doesn't come just to save us from sin. He comes to save us from our, our fears and our worries and our doubts and our shame and our guilt. Save us from our addiction. Save us from our insecurity. Save us from uh, problems that we have in our lives. He comes to save us from all these things. But it takes us letting go and being secure about that. Saying, Lord, here it are. Here they are. Now, Last night, uh, well, let me just put it this way. How does this relate to Christmas? How does it relate to us? I, I don't know how to describe this, but last night, as I was getting ready for that, I had what I consider a big revelation for me from God. There were no flashes of light, no voices. Maybe it's just purely an insight, but it was powerful. If you remember last week, we talked about how for a lot of people, Christmas morning as children was full of wonder and awe and excitement and joy, and it was awesome. I begin to ask the question, why? Why was it like that? And then I remembered, maybe this is the insight, I don't know. It's because at that moment, that child felt very valued, very loved, whether it was from Santa Claus or from parents or friends, when we receive gifts, we feel valued and loved. And as we get older, we still want that same value and love, that awesomeness of feeling, that value and love. At the same time, if you remember last week, we talked about there's a whole group of people who did not have good experiences as children. Christmas was not good, and they do not like decorations. They do not like the songs. And the reason? As children. They were not valued, not loved. And then there's another group of people right now who were valued and loved one way or the other, but they're going through a blue Christmas because people they valued and people they loved have died or they divorced them or broke up or there's a loss of job, and so we don't feel that same value because we miss that. We miss that. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us says, I value enough that I, like it says in Philippians 1, leave heaven to come to us and to save us, like finds us, like the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, the hidden treasure, searches for us, like, the, like we're the most valuable pearl in the world, loves us enough to even die for us, Die so that we can live. That's how much we are valued. I notice as people get older, especially older people, what do you want for Christmas? All I want is to be with you. What are they saying? I don't need gifts. I need to be valued. I need to love. I want to value you. I want to love you. And that's what Jesus did at Christmas. While this chapel tells couple stories I love. One is about this college student. He came home from college and said, you know, I don't need a God who saves me. I just want a God I can identify with. Wallace says, okay. So you're in a fire on the 16th floor at a hotel, and a fireman somehow gets to you. Do you care if it's a fireman that you can identify with or one that you can, will save you? Well, in reality, God, Emmanuel, is one we can identify with. Jesus, Savior, is one who saves us. We get both. We get both. And the key element, and this is the irony, what we want is to feel valued and love. And the irony, in fact, Jesus shows us how to do that by focusing not on people valuing and loving us, but by giving it away. And in that process of valuing and loving other people, it comes back to us. Wallace tells this other story about this little boy who went to the pet shop, and there at the pet shop, 
saw a little puppy that he wanted to buy. He goes home. He comes back with his dollar and 93 cents, walks up to the store owner, pulls on his pants leg and says, Mister, I want to buy that dog. The man looks at the dog, looks at the money, looks at the boy and says, I'm sorry, son, but that little puppy's not for sale. No, he was sad. So he walks over to the puppy, kneels down, pets the dog, then comes back and yanks on the man's pants again, says, Mister, I want to buy that dog. And looks at the boy and says, I'm sorry, son, but the dog's not for sale. He gets really upset. Kind of sits there, stands there, kind of pouts. And then he walks over to the man and yanks on his pants. Says, mister, I want to buy that puppy. The man stopped what he was doing, put his hands on the shoulder of the boy, walked over with him to the puppy, knelt down. They're both on their knees looking at the puppy. And the man says, you see that puppy? The puppy was in an accident. He's lost one eye, one ear is half gone, both front legs are broken, he's got cuts all over his body. We're going to put this puppy asleep. That's why he's not for sale. Instantly, that boy jumped up, stepped back from that man, reached down, pulled up his pants legs, showed the man his braces on his legs and says, Mister, see what love can do? That puppy needs me. That's the message of Christmas. Jesus comes to save us. And then through us, he reaches out to give the love to others. And in that process, Christmas becomes awesome, magical, powerful. Will you pray with me? As you look at an image of Jesus right in front of you, notice his love, his hands reaching out to you. And he's saying, I love you. Receive my love. I want to help you. Receive my help. Let me value you. Let me love you. Receive it. Surrender your fight to me. What is it you need to let go to give to Jesus? Where is it you need to let Jesus help you? Lord Jesus, on behalf of this whole congregation, I pray for your Holy Spirit to flow in through our minds, our lives, and you give us that touch that says we are valued and loved by you. But also, Lord, help us to share that. Help us to give it away. And in process, Lord, give us that awesomeness of Christmas. That this year it's born in a more powerful way than ever. As we pray in Christ's name, amen. Amen.